welcome back to the Deep Six Wrestling Podcast. It is officially Monday, uh, September 6th, so uh, All Out has just concluded. It is 12.04 in the morning, and, you know, obviously with us covering AEW, it wouldn't make sense for us to not talk about All Out. And so, we're going to do that. Unfortunately, Joey will not be joining us for the podcast tonight, so it's just a two-man show. It's going to be me and Ryan, and... We're going to go through the whole show, give our thoughts and reactions, talk about what we liked, anything we didn't like, and I guess where we see things going, moving in the future, because as much as CM Punk's arrival to AEW signaled that this is a new era for the company, this show pushed that to the limit, and so we're going to talk about that. So if you're new here, be sure to subscribe to the podcast. It's completely free. We are streaming on basically every streaming service, Apple, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, Google+, Anchor, um... I'm sure I missed some stuff. So be sure to subscribe. You can find any of the links down there in the episode description. Also follow us over on Twitter at Deep Six Wrestling without the G. We've just hit 270 followers, so we're closing in on 300. So if you're listening and want to help us out to uh, to get to another milestone, you can do that. Uh, we sometimes live tweet shows. We also post opinions, and we post when we have new content out. So be sure to do that. And you can check out our YouTube channel where we just finally posted a punishment that was due last year from ryan in which he had to do his own form of uh bad porn acting um obviously no actual porn. no actual porn it is completely safe for work um I mean, there's, cursing. there's cursing but at this point i feel like cursing is kind of safe for work yeah. um no nudity or anything so you can check that out it's two minutes on our youtube channel if you'd like to and coming up this week, we have our Raw review on Monday. That is going to feel so interesting to watch after tonight's AEW show. Uh, on tap, we have a few matches announced. We have uh, Sheamus versus Drew McIntyre in a number one contenders match for the United States Championship. That should actually probably be pretty good. If they keep it. I have a feeling they will. Um, we have a big seven-team gauntlet match for the number one contendership for the the Raw tag team titles. And when I first saw this, I did not know that there were seven teams in, like even active on Raw. Uh, so props to them, I guess, for managing to have that. And the big one, Charlotte Flair defends her Raw Women's Championship against the woman who beat her last week, Nia Jax. We're doing the match again. It's for the title. Will Charlotte retain? Who knows? But that's what we got for Raw after this historic show tonight that will go down in the history books. Wednesday, AEW Dynamite is coming from Cincinnati. They're advertising it as John Moxley's homecoming. And the big match on that show we'll get to later on. Uh, but we will have a review for that as well. And then this weekend you'll probably get uh, Ryan and Angela's Impact Power Hour. Um, because I believe from here on out they're going to be moving towards Friday or weekend releases for that. So... Uh, that is what's coming up on the podcast feed, so be sure to subscribe for all of that. Once again, it is completely free, costs you absolutely nothing, so be sure to do that. And without further ado, we can start talking about AEW All Out, the 2021 edition. So if you're just joining us and you're new here, I'm Pat, and I'm joined by... I'm Ryan. So, this was a show that had quite a bit of hype going into it um, for, I feel like, quite a lot of people. Uh, this, this, there was a lot of potential surprises. The card was fairly stacked, I think most people would agree. And so uh, we're going to talk about how we uh, feel this this delivered. Ryan, what would you say your hype level was going into the show tonight? Um, probably close to a, like a Mojo Raleigh level, like how hype he is, which is always hype. Um, I was very excited for the show, but I'm always excited for. AEW pay-per-views and I think that's one of those things where they're so spaced out and they always have really good cards so it's, it's very hard to not be hyped for one of them uh, especially with all the rumors flying around plus Punk's return and of course everybody's favorite match that was advertised QT Marshall versus or QT Marshall versus Big Show Paul White Paul White yeah. the Big Show Paul White yeah. well, I'm calling him Fair enough. Um, similar, I would also say my hype levels were pretty high for this. Um, probably the most they've been for an AEW pay-per-view, which says a lot, because anytime they have a pay-per-view, they, they really just like deliver, but there was just like a, an increased level of hype and anticipation for this, and I think a lot of it came from the CM Punk debut and knowing he was returning, but when you looked at what was put on the card and everything that could happen and ended up did happening, um, it just it led to basically like a fever pitch of excitement, so... 
Uh, the opening thing we had here was the buy-in. Uh, so originally we were supposed to have Andrade versus Pac, but that got pulled. Uh, so the Women's Casino Battle Royal was moved to the main card, and in its place was put uh, the best friends, Chuck Taylor, Orange Cassidy, and Wheeler Yuta, and the Jurassic Express, uh, represented by Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus, versus the Hardy Family Office, TH2, Private Party, and Matt Hardy. Uh, this is what you would expect from what, I mean, this is what should really be a pre-show match. Uh, it was just like fast-paced, super energetic, lots of big spots everywhere uh, for like five, ten minutes. And it was just basically the palate, like uh, or like an appetizer for the audience here. Um, really just got the crowd energetic and hyped to start the show. So um, I liked it. There were some really cool spots here with uh, Jungle Boy, who continues to just be like a star of the show. Um, so I liked it, uh, and the, the baby faces one kind of as expected to open the show. Um, no real thoughts coming out of this, just excited to see more of Jungle Boy doing big things. Yeah, nine big Jungle Boy was great. Wheeler you looked really good too. Um, and I mean, Orange Cassidy when he does his, like, when he kicks into overdrive is always great. Um, I thought the one really cool spot was, uh, uh, I guess THQ2 uh, and Lucha's... Uh, oh, the chicken fight. Yeah, the chicken fight. Luchasaurus had Jungle Boy on his shoulders and, and Helico had uh, Jack Evans on their his shoulders. And that was a cool spot. Um, also, after that, you had Jungle Boy doing like a Matrix uh, move, dodging Mark Quen, uh, who was coming in for a crossbody. And then... Catching, catching Isaiah Cassidy for like a power slam, which was really cool. Yeah, well, not oh. just a power slam, a power slam off, off of, of Luchasaurus's shoulders. Luchasaurus, shoulders yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Jungle Boy tapped out uh, Angelico with uh, Angelico. Angelico, sorry, Angelico no. with the stair trap. After the match, the heels beat down Orange Cassidy, and the Butcher makes his return. The Butcher's back, baby. The, Andy Williams of Every Time I Die. The best part of this entire thing was once he came in and laid out Orange Cassidy. He did the knees. He did the knees. He did his, not his, his stomping knees, whatever yeah. you want to call it. Uh, and then he brought out scissors, and I was very confused. And then the, the baby faces got them away, and then this was a really long stare down of, like, Andy Williams, or the butcher, putting, like, scissors to his neck, which was just his fingers. Uh, Jack Evans, like, holding the scissors and just chopping them. Uh, Matt Hardy says he wants Cassidy again, um, and the baby face is just all being in the ring. Um, well, we should also note that during this, we we got um, Jurassic Express coming back out, uh, Preston and John from Dark Order and the yeah. Varsity Blondes yep. all came out to make the save, and there was a big group hug. Yeah. Um, if this is going to a hair versus hair match... It doesn't make sense to do it with Orange Cassidy because he doesn't have a lot of hair. And you can say, well, the shock value of a bald Orange Cassidy would be something. But, like, his character, he's, he doesn't care about anything. I'm, I'm not going to complain about a hair versus hair match. Yeah. It's, like, it's it, it should just be, be like, Wheeler or Wheeler Yuta and Andy, if they were going to do... Because, like, like, Andy Williams, if he's going to be involved... He has his mustache and facial hair. You do him versus you Wheeler. I don't know. Like, it just Orange some... Cassidy going bald with already short hair versus like Matt Hardy or this seems very different. And Helica. like everybody else in the group has very long hair. So like that's more like of the people that were shown with to be involved in the scissor stuff. Oh, yeah, I guess. Like obviously Isaiah Cassidy wouldn't be would be something, but like Mark Quen would even. Yeah, I, again, this is. They did not even mention a hair versus hair thing, so this might not be an actual thing. It, it might just be Butcher carries around scissors now. And gives him the Jack Evans for some reason. Uh, after this, we caught up with Dan Lambert, who was up in a private box suite with uh, Jorge Masvidal, Junior Dos Santos, Andre Orlovsky, and Scorpio Sky and Ethan Page. He got a standard um, Dan Lambert promo here. And then Page and Scorpio basically just cut a promo here but they officially refer to themselves as american top team so this does officially seem like they are now a faction here in AEW. um and they kind of put out like a challenge saying that nobody's gonna step to them um so it'll be interesting to see who eventually does step to american top team do you have any well i, I should say my original guess was that it was going to be suzuki and archer um 
I don't think I'm standing by that now. I don't really have a pick for who else it would be, but I don't really see it being that. So my thinking is just to go with this. It's like Scorpio Sky and uh, uh, Paige and Dan Lambert all point to like the MMA people as being America's top team okay, so with the be- with the men of the year. So uh, it does seem like they are not technically part. Of that, I mean, they could obviously move them into it, but um, it they did clarify that, like Dan Lambert said, like to my right is the UFC people, the former champions representing America's top team, and to my left are the men of the year, Ethan Payton, and Scorpio Sky. Uh, also, Scorpio Sky apparently signed a new five-year deal with AEW, so five more good old years with good old Scorp. Uh, always good to see because he's fantastic. Um, I still don't get the whole idea of putting Ethan Page and Scorpio with them because, like, Dan Lambert, like, has, like, his criticisms of AEW and his promos have all been, like, oh, there's flashy, you've got all these guys who are flashy and doing big moves and goofing around, and literally that ex- that explains Ethan Page to the T is a goofball who's trying to be flashy and does some cool moves. I'd say uh, prior to AEW, I would describe him as a, a goofball. From what we've seen in AEW, I wouldn't really say he does goofy things. Like, sometimes his promos are a bit goofy, but he seems more of, like, a mentally insane person with the stuff he did with Darby. Yeah, but, like... Uh, score, you... But, like, their, their, their personas and how they present themselves. Yes, flashy, yes. over the top, I agree. Yes. yes, and then, like, I mean, Ethan Page still, like as he like takes off his gear like yes. dances and stuff like that's not who i would picture as like mma super tough guy team i will make a counterpoint to that and just point out somebody like conor mcgregor who is the face of mma basically and is super over the top i'm also well how like they've shown jorge masvidal how he dresses yeah but that's of. that is for a Mazdaval's gimmick, like he is the baddest motherfucker champion. Yeah. Which is just you talk to get involved in it. It's basically for a Mazdaval has to say, "I want to face you because you're you think you're a badass and you think you're hot shit." Um, and it, I, I think it's been defended once. And it was against Nate Diaz or Nick Nate Diaz. Um, and hasn't been done ever again. Um, but, like, Foray Mazdaval is, like, an actual person who could knock you the fuck out. Whereas Ethan Page and Scorpio Sky, like, it's not how they're presented. Um, they're, no, but Lambert did put over the fact that Scorpio Sky yes. has done MMA, and yes. Ethan Page did, uh, like, karate. karate. Yeah, so. Karate. At, least they, at least they've tried to yeah. integrate it. So, I mean, um, it's more props than I would have assumed they would have. Yeah. So. Lambert just seemed, like, whenever Ethan Page and Scorpio Sky talked, he just looked so grumpy, uh, which is totally different than, like, Ethan Page and Scorpio Sky's, like, happy-go-lucky attitude, even when they're, like, losing and being assholes. Um... Yeah, um, don't have too much else to say. Um, going off of what Pat said about like the Archer and Suzuki, I think Suzuki sticks. He's we know he's going to be in America for quite some time. Um, I think that we're still going to get Suzuki and Archer. I just think that Archer is going to attack either uh, next week or this week or next week against them. Uh, and he's going to get beaten down, or he's going to have a match that they beat him down, and Suzuki comes to make the save uh, so that you, you can have those two still. It doesn't make 100% sense, but I definitely think that, like, if we'll get to it later, but Suzuki was wearing the exact same pants that Archer has had, like, the last two times he's come out now. Yeah, it's the Suzuki game um, yeah. So I, mean, I think they're definitely showing that they have the ties. Yeah, well, and, and also AEW really likes to do symbolism. And also Archer and Lance are announced for tagging on the New Japan shows. Suzuki, Suzuki, yeah, Archer and Suzuki. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and it would also make sense because Suzuki does have lots of ties to MMA with yes. Pancras. Um, so uh, it would kind of be a natural fit if he wanted to do stuff. Yeah, with... he's an actual legitimate man that I feared for. I would fear for my life. 
Yeah. Uh, so spoiler alert, we'll talk about Suzuki later, but he was on the show. Yeah. So anyway, this sent us into the actual uh, pay-per-view, and we opened with the TNT Championship, Eddie Kingston versus Miro. Um, I thought it made sense as the opener, but it also felt like an interesting choice for the opener mm-hmm. as... I don't know, I kind of felt like you were going to set this up for like a big baby face win to kickstart the night here, but uh, that's not what we ended up getting. Uh, that being said, I thought this was a really fantastic opening match. Uh, Miro and Eddie Kingston just clicked. This is Eddie's best match in some time, and obviously me, we, we talked about this during the predictions, but this was probably inarguably Miro's um, best match in some time as well. Maybe best match in AEW so far. Um, the only thing I'd put it up against would be Arcade Anarchy, which was really fun. I was going to say, him and Darby was really good. Yeah, that's true. Uh, him and, and him and Ar- Archer even had a good match. Yeah, I would it put... It was just those two, and then it, his reign kind of fell off because he was just facing around the people. Yeah, I would I would say this would probably be above Darby and Lance for me, personally. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I agree with that. This felt like a big fight. Um, Mira was very over as a heel. Kingston was incredibly over as a face. Uh, the Eddie chance just, like, rang out through here. Um, and the... Redeem these nuts chance at the beginning. Yeah, we did. He did. He did shirts. wear the redeem these nuts shirt. Uh, shirt. There were signs for redeem these nuts in the crowd. Yeah, he got um, it over, baby. Miro, I do want to say Miro did get cheers originally, um, but he definitely. This was the most heel we've seen of Miro, I think, uh, by far, um, and he definitely, as the match went further and further, the crowd definitely went got more he got more heat on him from the crowd which i thought was fantastic yeah. because one of my biggest complaints about certain people in AEW that are champions um is that they are supposed to be heels and the, they don't do anything that the crowd dislikes um so they're really not heels in my book if the crowd is going to cheer everything they do and miro doing this to somebody who like everybody loves Basically, like Eddie, uh, made perfect sense to dr- drive him further down the heel path uh, and away from the fans actually loving him, even if we love him as a wrestler. Yeah, fair points. Um, again, I thought both guys did just absolutely wonderful performances. We had some great like false finishes towards the end. There was a spot where Eddie uh, took off the turnbuckle pad and uh, the ref didn't see it originally. And this played into Eddie getting basically a visual pin over Miro, but it wasn't enough. Um, the the turnbuckle ended up coming back into play um, as Eddie tried to get Miro to go into it. That didn't happen. Miro tried to get him into it. Um, did anybody end up actually going into the turnbuckle? I feel like they, they didn't. I feel like they just teased it. Yeah, no. Um, what's your call? So, um, as Eddie tried to run Miro into it at the end... Uh, Bryce got in the way because it was blatantly yeah, was. Yeah. he was running him into it and you can't do that that is disqualifying like throw, doing an Irish whip across the ring into an a, a exposed uh, turnbuckle is one thing literally walking them over to try to smash their face into it is another thing uh, and Bryce told him you can't do that Miro took this opportunity to mule kick him in the, the groin um, and then basically took over uh real quickly for the win yeah um and again i thought this was a really solid match um i I, I thought very very good opener uh for the main card um and mirror's reign continues do you have a guess as to who takes it from him still or i am still going to go with mox um for my predictions i think mox is going to come to redeem uh, Kingston, I think Kingston's gonna have one more match with them. Um, I think it's gonna be like a no DQ match, and I think that's where you could see either somebody else help Miro, or that's where Lana, CJ, whatever she's gonna be called, show up um, as like a his manager, his wife, obviously, um, and then we can have Mox come in. Um, depending on what his schedule is going to be like for the next few weeks and months. If he's going to go on the road with New Japan for maybe a few shows, I don't know. He's been announced for, what, the November shows? Yeah. So, I mean, if it, it's going to be interesting to see what his schedule is going to be like for the, 
the next few weeks or months because if he goes like November to December for the New Japan America shows and then like because I'm assuming New Japan is tr going to try to have all hands on deck for Wrestle Kingdom you'd have Moxley go over there and if that's the case and I don't see Moxley being the person to take it off of Miro if he's going to be gone for a few months <laughs> Um. Yeah, I could see Moxley being it. If I was going to take a pick right now, I think I'd probably go Sammy Guevara. Yeah, I, um, I think Sammy's a good safe pick too. Sammy has gotten increasingly over with fans as of late, and I just feel like if they wanted to strap a rocket to him, have him beat Miro, and you can count it as payback for Fuego. Yeah. Um, I think Moxley and Sammy would be the two right now that I think would be the most logical choices. Yeah, the only other person I think you could throw on there would be... Jungle Boy. Just because I'm very... We'll get to the ending of this show and what it seems to set up. But I I just feel like Jungle Boy would make sense. Because I think Jungle Boy is the most over, like, homegrown AEW star. Like, he's... Oh, I think he's more over than Darby. I think he's more over than... Um, Anybody else that AEW has that isn't Punk, Omega, the Bucks, the Lucha Bros, and the newer additions that we'll talk about later. And Mox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And maybe Kingston? Because Kingston, Kingston was really over tonight. Uh, yeah, Kingston, that whole first match was just absolutely... I didn't realize... Like, I know a lot of people like Kingston. I didn't realize it was that much that they love him. Yeah. Um, oh, also, one last thing about this match. Holy fuck was <laughs> Miro's chest bruised oh the fuck God. up. Yeah, Miro's chest was, like, caved in with, like, the... Uh, the there were line. literally, paw like, handprints of not just red, of legitimate bruises forming throughout the match, which was insane. Um, neither of these guys let up, and I loved every minute of this match. Yeah, okay. Um... I'm just checking Twitter to see. I believe they're doing uh, a media scrum, so uh, hopefully it finishes by the time we're done so we can go over anything. Um, but after this, we went to our big interpromotional match, John Moxley taking on Satoshi Kojima of New Japan. Moxley won the GCW Championship from Matt Cardona last night, and he didn't come out with the title, but he did come out in a GCW hoodie, and there was loud GCW chants at the start of this match, so pretty cool moment for GCW. Um pretty cool to see we pointed out because we all watched together uh the squad uh, minus angelo um but we point out that we've been we've known about game changer wrestling and game changer as a company since basically they formed and it's so weird to see that they went from being a company that formed to make a music festival then a, a weird app um a with music related band like bands and stuff uh doing games to creating a music venue I forgot about the mobile games yep. like the bands Jesus. Yep. yeah uh to then making two venues um one in New Jersey and one in uh Allentown New uh PA um to closing both of them down and just going full on into wrestling it is the weirdest fucking transition I've ever seen, um, but this it's it's weird that like their music festivals were pretty big at least on the East Coast, and now they've got like a, a an internationally recognized uh, wrestling company. Um, so very weird uh, timeline that we live in today. Yeah, you're uh, you're not wrong. Um, Anyway, I think going into this, a lot of people felt somewhat, not slighted, but disappointed in the announcement that it was going to be Kojima versus Moxley. I think a lot of people assumed it was going to be either Suzuki or Tanahashi. Um, I was perfectly fine with it not being it. Um, as somebody who's a big Kojima fan, it was nice to see him get a spotlight here on AEW's biggest show that he they've got done. A good reaction. Too. Oh, the crowd loved him when he came yeah. out, and they loved him the whole match too. I think this helps that like AEW definitely feels like they have a more not casual fan oh, of are, New they're, Japan. They're 
Yeah, they're they're very very hardcore. Where when like it came to like Kojima showing up in like Impact, there were people who were like, "Oh man, that's a weird get for Impact," but like he's gonna have some cool matches, and he did have some good matches. Like him versus Joe Doring was really good um, out of nowhere. Um, him tagging with uh, Eddie was something. Uh, or was going to team with Eddie, uh, and yeah, um, I thought that was just more random, um, because again, no crowd, uh, at the time, um, so, like, I wouldn't know how the Impact crowd would have cared, um, but clearly, uh, the AEW crowd is much more enthusiastic about the New Japan guys coming over, because, like, even Narita and... Nagata, when they showed up in AEW, they got good reactions, uh, and that was smaller crowds at the time. And when Kenta showed up, that was very t- a small town, small time crowd at that point. Um, so, yeah, uh, this was cool to see, and we pointed out together as a group that <laughs> compared to the New Japan shows that we've been watching. Uh, it is night and day the reaction these guys got, because in New Japan it is still just you're only allowed to clap, and here it's like cheers, chanting, loud s- screams and yells and everything, boos and cheers. Uh, so it's gotta be like if I'm a wrestler in New Japan, I would want to come to New Japan of America and do any American shows as possible. And I understand like maybe they want to be more cautious because of COVID, but like those New Japan shows are so hard to watch compared to, like, these shows where there's crowds. Uh, yeah, again, like you said, it's absolutely night and day. Um, it's just like, again, come on, as somebody who's been a New Japan fan for years, these shows have been unbearable to watch. These two Wrestle Grand Slam shows, I, I, I didn't make it through the first one. I Like, I actively chose to quit. And uh, yesterday, before Shingo and Evil, I passed out. So uh, it's just, it's just, I, I can't do it. Um, so I will not be waking up live for these G1 shows. It may be the finale, but the the active tournament, I'll just catch highlights of, or not highlights. I'll just pick and choose what matches to watch, especially with the lineup. Yeah, I mean, uh, we've got to just hope that, like, I've said, we've said it very, very much before that we just hope that the rest of the world, it. it it's weird to say that like America like is so ahead of like the vaccine and everything when like you, you always hear like the reports of all oh, the, these states aren't doing anything or whatnot, um, but like comparing that like America to um, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and their vaccination rates, and I understand they don't have as many people and they don't have as many vaccines available but like it is just insane to think about just like before the olympics it was i think like less than 10 percent of japan had been vaccinated and like america like we're so close to getting to we're like we're like a little over 50 or a little under 50 in like august so like we're so close to getting like 70 75 percent where we're where things are looking really good and it's just wild to see how the other countries are handling it um especially since they're so small compared to america um and if you're like an international person who's watching a new japan show compared to like an AEW show or wwe show even with full crowds you've got to be wondering like what the fuck can we do to get get crowd, like active crowds again? Uh, yeah, the, the the I guess the quicker that happens, the better. Because New Japan right now is remember not looking you, too good. Remember when New Japan ran, ran uh, rolled out that app to like make noises for people? Oh, what a weird time! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that never really do anything. Yeah, yeah. no. Nah. Um, so yeah, no idea. But uh, New Japan. New Japan mainline down bad. New Japan strong up good. Yeah, I, I do. We might have to start watching New Japan tr- strong shows again. Yeah, we could. Hey, man, if we ever decide to do another podcast, we can do Rampage and uh, AEW and or, strong. Or, well, isn't hours. strong moving? It's moving to Saturdays. Yeah, okay. we can do those together. Technically. 
Yeah. Anyway, um, Moxley wins after two paradigm shifts. After the match, Minoru Suzuki's theme song comes on. The crowd goes bananas. They even do the uh, Kaze I, I can't pronounce it. Yeah. I'm not. Excalibur did. That man is more well versed than me. You know who um, wasn't well versed with this? It was JR, oh. who, as it clearly says, Minoru Suzuki and is showing the pictures of Minoru Suzuki on his entrance team. He's like, Who is this? This can't be that guy that I've heard of. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> it's good JR. old Uncle JR. <laughs> um, anywho, Suzuki comes down. The crowd goes uh, just crazy for him. Um, this is the best reaction a heel got all night. Because <laughs> he did come out the heel entrance. Yeah. Um, stares down Moxley. They just start beating each other up with forearms. Moxley gets his blood all over Suzuki. Um... And then we, we get Minoru putting on the sleeper hold, and eventually he locks in the gotch pile driver and slams Moxley down. And yeah, we did get the announcement later on in the show that Moxley versus Suzuki is not happening at Arthur Ashe. It's not happening on New Japan. It's happening this week on AEW Dynamite in Cincinnati. This will, I would assume, either be the opening or the main event. I think this has to be the main event, since it's the, it is literally built the homecoming oh, yeah. match. Oh, yeah. um, so. I do have to say, um, love to see Suzuki get, uh, and I, I forget where it was. <laughs> was it like that Reddit post? Was it Reddit or like just on Twitter where somebody was like, oh, like the New Japan fans have gotten, like Minoru Suzuki has grown stale here and like they want Tai, like him and Tai Chi have heat between oh, yeah, each other. The, it was on the New and, Japan subreddit. Yeah, and, like, hopefully Tai Chi overthrows Suzuki soon and, like, Suzuki can go somewhere else. You wouldn't, like, the New the new Japan fans might feel like that in Japan if that's the case, but <laughs> the American crowds love this man. Uh, and me and Pat and Joey and even Rob all point out that we all big Suzuki fans. Uh, he can still go. He is the epitome of still being able to be a total badass in, in your 50s. Yeah, 100%. I'm very excited for this. Their first match was good, so I'm excited to watch it again. Yeah. Um, up next was our AEW Women's World Championship match. I think this was going on earlier than we all expected it to, uh, on before the Battle Royal, um, but I don't think that was a bad call. Uh, Britt Baker versus Chris Statlander. Both received pretty good reactions here. Uh, Chris came out with Orange Cassidy, who stayed ringside. Well, she came out with the best friends who all had matching gray suit or uh, sweatshirts and gray pants, yeah. which was weird. And uh, Chuck, I think, had like weird glasses on that were like they looked like safety sure goggles. Um, but yeah, the anyway, Orange... Cassidy was at ringside. That's yeah, Bray came out with Rebel and Jamie. Um, and yeah, uh, I thought this actually was a pretty solid match out of the entire card. I feel like, the, well, aside from Paul White and QT Marshall, this was the one I would say I had the lowest expectations for, but it was the one I guess I was looking forward to the least just because the story hasn't really been there, but Britt's gotten incredibly over and she's had some great performances in ring and Chris is great. So, um, they delivered. I thought this was really fun. Um, there was a couple of near falls towards the end. I don't think anybody really bought that Chris was going to win here, but um, the crowd still like gave them a good reaction, um, and they were with it for the whole match. And that's something that the crowd deserves all the praise for. That through this entire show, um, they were with this. They even, I mean, they didn't cheer as loud as I think some of the other matches got for QT and Paul White, but that's expected. And it took a while for them to get into Kenny versus Christian, but I feel like that's because the beginning of the match was pretty slow. And also, again, we've already seen Christian and Kenny, so it's not like it was this brand new, fresh match. Um, I think a lot of the air had been sucked. Like the the, I think people were starting to get tired at that yeah, point 100%. because the middle of this card was a whirlwind of matches. This was this was an insane again. This is an insane pay per view from start to finish, um, but. We'll give our full thoughts at the end. Yeah, I do have to say my one big thing here, or two, I guess. One is Orange Cassidy freaked the fuck out, mm -hmm. uh, throwing his sunglasses off and screaming at Chris to get back in the ring. Yeah, this was the most uh, fired up we've ever seen. This was fantastic work by Cassidy. Um, and then I, I will continue to say this, but 
Britt has to be. I think Britt is on the Kevin Owens level when Kevin Owens debuted on, I guess, Raw against Cena with how he was a heel and supposed to be this awful heel that you're supposed to hate. But literally anything they do, like her, Rebel, and Jamie, mainly Jamie and Britt because people really like Jamie and people love Britt. Um, no matter what they do, they can cheat, they can beat the crap out of people uh, before matches, after matches, during matches, uh, and the crowd loves it. And that is a dangerous place to be in because that really hurts every baby face. <laughs> because you're like, I don't know, at this point, like, there's nobody on the roster, I think, at this point, women, women's wise, who even had, like, that Brit could do anything to and get booed. Like, substantial boos. Like, they might get booed for, like, a night, but they go to the next town. She's going to be over, one of the most over people in the company, like, getting baby face cheers for what she does. So, it's very weird. Like, I don't want, I don't know if you want to turn her baby face at all, because she's so good as, like, a character of a heel, and she was so bad as a babyface character, but it is so off-putting to have your top heel just, no matter what she does, be babyface right reactions. Um, I wouldn't say it's off-putting for me. I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, man, the AEW fans are bad. No, AEW I'm not bad. saying that at all. Um, but I, I, it doesn't affect my enjoyment of her matches or the show um, that she gets cheered by people. I just think that if you're trying to build up like a baby face to topple her, it's not going to be as effective because... I think you have a number of baby faces who will get cheered against Britt, but Britt will stay cheered. I don't think you're ever going to get something where there's going to be a baby face that they'll get people to boo Britt. Yeah. But I also think that you have a number of baby faces just from listening tonight where they will cheer them. Yeah. Thunder Rosa is one. Anna and Ty are both very over. Yeah. And Ruby, the reaction she got, um, I don't see any of those four getting booed against Britt. Yeah. Unless you did it in Pittsburgh, but I don't think yeah. they'll be doing that. Um, so I, I'm not too worried about that. I think when the time comes to take the title off of it, AEW fans will kind of just behave themselves and not try to hijack it. Yeah. Um, Britt won with the lockjaw, and yeah, so she retains and her reign continues. Who would... It- who would you ideally want? Rosa. Thunder Rosa, yeah. 100%. I would say either Thunder Rosa or Jamie. Jamie Turner. Yeah, if they, yeah but that would be like down, down the road. Down the road, yeah. yeah I, still think, I still personally think it should be Thunder Rosa. I do as well, but if you were going to have it where you want, you've realized where it's never going to be booed anywhere. Yeah. And you want to just turn her full baby face, then that would be the way. Jamie turn on her and yeah. anything else. Yeah, that's fine. Um, we got a brief promo from Andrade uh, talking about um, the the match that he's supposed to have with Pac. Says that he's here to fight and he wouldn't miss a show. Um, and Chavo denied canceling Pac's flight. But knew what flight he would be on and claims he doesn't have American Airlines' number or app. And then Andrade like lowered his glasses at this point because he was like, how did you know he was on that, those flights? And he's like, well, if, if he was on those flights. Um I think this is definitely playing into Chavo leaving this group, um, which sucks because he's been good. And he's really good on the mic, and everybody loves Chavo. Um, but I think at, at, at most people know who is going to come to be with Andrade. Yeah, it seems pretty clear we're getting Ric Flair. Um, so, But I'm interested. I think that the most interesting thing about this and... The Lucha Brothers match that we're going to talk about in a bit is the whole storyline with Andrade has been unless you align with me, you'll never win the titles. And Pac isn't there. Do you have the Lucha Brothers like during Pac versus uh, Andrade uh, on Rampage turn on Pac and align themselves with? Uh, Andrade. I think that that's the interesting thing to look out for on Rampage. Cause I would not be shocked if that's the case. Yeah, 
We'll, uh, we'll definitely see. Uh, again, Andrade and Pac is happening this week on Rampage, so that story will continue and probably mm-hmm. play out there. <clears throat> After this, we go to the tag match. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, this set us up for the Lucha Brothers versus the Young Bucks in a steel cage match for the AEW World Championship. Or sorry, the AEW World Tag Team Championship, mm-hmm. not the World Championship. Uh, the Lucha Brothers were out first. Uh, they were played to the ring by, I believe, Mikey Ruckus, the guy who does the theme songs, as well as some Spanish rapper who I don't remember the name of. Yeah, uh, so I looked the guy up. Um, apparently, he's like a big wrestling fanatic uh, and does like songs for wrestlers. Oh. So he's very similar to. Josiah Williams? Yeah. Um, but like he, like when he does tours and stuff in Mexico for like or like anywhere like he's always wearing wrestling related gear uh, apparently like there's pictures of him with like uh the um the bullet club like stuff like logo and stuff on his like d like the dj equipment mm-hmm. and the speakers and stuff so it seems like he was just like there to okay. um yeah i didn't have an issue with the performance i thought this was one of the better li- like like people yeah like to play out somebody like this is much better than like well we got a tale of two stories here because we'll talk about another live performance on this show i was gonna say like of the recent ones we can think of though like even in AEW, there's downstate which is going to go down as one of the worst I yeah think. well i was gonna talk about the one for tonight yes yeah. and then we also have uh ash costello oh, and new year's day for Rhea at mania that was disgustingly awful. um but then you've got this, and this this was like one of the loudest pops of the night was for the Lucha Bros as they came out, yeah, and the crowd this, was so into this, this was, performance. This was a, this was a star making um, performance for the Lucha Brothers. Their entrance came off crazy. We had a big special entrance for him uh, for them with the rapper or the rappers, I should say. They had back uh, background dancers, and then they came out in these like crazy headdresses um, and cool looking gear. We had their pyro and everything. Crowd was going bananas. And then the Young Bucks came out um, and were rightfully booed. Um, Nick Jackson, do you want to talk about your thoughts on Nick Jackson's Nick, new look? Nick Jackson has the worst facial hair I have seen in professional wrestling ever. Like I saw people who were like, oh, he's got the Scott Steiner goatee. No, this is so much worse because people aren't recognizing that he had a mustache. And the mustache is dyed... Like his natural hair color, or their, the, whatever hair color he's rocking, I don't know if it's, I don't think it's his natural hair no. color. It's like a light brown, but it's so, like, as it gets closer to, like, his, um, his nose and, like, the middle of his face, it just gets blonder and blonder, and it looks absolutely disgusting. And I understand their gimmick is to be, like, as over the top as possible. This is disgusting. And I really hope he either dyes it back to a normal color or shaves it the fuck off. Because if I see this for another week, I am going to vomit. Um, yeah, I, su- I suppose that's a, that's a fair point. Um, you know, it's definitely not a look I would ever want to be seen with in public. <laughs> Uh, it's something. I wouldn't want anybody in my entourage to be wearing something like that. Ryan is so mad he's actually storming away from our recording session. Um, anyway, th- I could not recap this match in a million years if I tried to. Um, I will say this went 22 minutes and 5 seconds. Uh, it felt so much longer because of how much stuff was going on. This was absolute insanity. I will I, From every steel cage match I have ever seen, this is the best one. Um, there wasn't any stupid escaping thing. They teased it at the beginning with the Bucks immediately trying to escape. To be fair, though, I think it really helps AEW that they pointed out that escape does not equal wins yeah. in AEW cage matches, it's, which is the smartest thing it's, ever. It's dumb. Because, it, like, normally these are, like, this obviously wasn't, but normally these are reserved for, like, blood feuds. And it's well, supposed to be, be, to be, this has been a blood yeah. feud for years, but, like, story, this yeah. has not been. Um, and, like, if you're, like, what was it? Braun Strowman and Shane McMahon, where, like, the whole thing was basically, let me try to escape. And it's like, what kind of blood feud ends with not a pinfall or a submission, but escaping? 
<laughs> That's so stupid. Um, and you can have good cage matches and everything, but if it ends in somebody leaving, getting out of the steel cage, and that's how it ends, is the stupidest thing in wrestling. And so far, the AEW has had two steel cage matches, correct? Cody and Wardlow, and yeah, now this. Both of them have been really good. And both of them, I think, definitely helped that, like, they know we can't, like, if we try to escape, it doesn't mean the end of the match. Um, which is good. Um, Ray Phoenix and Pentagon are still, I think, uh, the best tag team in the world um, at this point. Uh, it's very hard to say otherwise. They don't have bad matches with anyone uh, that I can think of. Um, and when it comes to big matches, they always, always overperform. Yeah. I think the only thing, one last thing to say about them is, I think the only thing that hurts them has been just the injuries. Like, it hurts their momentum. That and also being in Death Triangle where your leader can't come into the country for months at a time yeah uh, the other thing is that they never signed long-term contracts they have always just done single year deals um so it's kind of hard to put faith and put a title on somebody if there's not a guarantee so one could hope that this points to a sign of them signing maybe an extended deal with aew um with them finally putting the titles on them um shows some confidence in them so and it's uh, long deserved because the i feel like the, the Lucha Brothers have been one of the most over teams since AEW first started, um, and now it's their time. So, uh, this match again, absolute insanity. Um, Definitely too 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 much to even talk about. This is out of all the matches on the show. This is the must watch one. Um, I would say that pretty the, much the, the whole show, show. Yeah, well, the whole show is like must watch besides QT and Paul White, um, but that's over in three minutes. So I would still say watch the entire show. And I'd say the Casino Battle Royal isn't, like, must-watch. I, I actually thought this was probably AEW's best Battle Royal. I'd agree, but I, I, I'm i not a f- fan of, like, their Battle Royal style. And I've said it before, they, I, I think there's I would better still, options. I'd still recommend it just to see Ruby's debut. That's fair. And the reaction she got. Um, Maybe one day we'll find out what happened to Riho. I have a feeling she got injured. Because they didn't mention, like they didn't mention she was eliminated. They didn't call any attention to it, and I have to say that sucks because she just came back from injury. Yeah. So if she is injured, then that sucks, and we wish her like fast recovery. If she wasn't injured, then there was a botch somewhere. Yeah, because um, we'll get to it when we get to that match. Yeah. Anyway, this was nuts. Go out of your way. This was a bloody mess. Everybody was bleeding by the end of this, except Matt. He yeah. Might, he might have been bleeding somewhere, to be yeah. honest. Um. I think all the blood, like any blood he had, was like somebody else's. Yeah, we had uh, the Bucks did land a BTE trigger on Penta. Penta Phoenix broke it up, and then the I don't know what their Fear Factory. Sh- what is it? Fear Factory. Fear Factory. Okay, is uh, the Lucha Brothers p- uh, finisher that got broken? Well, up. it's the one finisher. Yeah, I don't know what the other one's called. Yeah, I don't either, and they didn't say it. No, they just basically called or shouted about it. Um, but so we had both their big finishes uh, get kicked out of. We had numerous package pile drivers. We had like a top rope um, Canadian destroyer. Um, we had Phoenix jumping off the cage, which we we could have gone so many ways. Like he got up there and Penta I, had him set uh, had uh, Matt set up for like a uh, super, uh, fear a f- super fear factory or fear factor, not fear, fear factory. factory yeah. um, and Nick comes in and super kicks Penta, and Penta just gets them. They end up ganging everybody up, and or I'm sorry, Nick then jumps up to the top, and they start uh, fighting, and he knocks uh, Nick down to the ground, uh, and then Penta gets everybody up and holds them in place for a crossbody. That was insane. Uh, Ray Phoenix continues to be the best, most um, fluid wrestler in the world in my book yeah um and then the lucha brothers eventually won and there was your big title change of the night the lucha brothers have officially ended the young bucks aw world tag team championship reign and are your new aw tag team champions joining 
SCU, Hangman Page and Omega, FTR, and the Young Bucks as the list of champions. Yeah. Um, this was a huge pop when they won. Yeah. It was fantastic. The cage race, they celebrated with their kids. Yeah. Um, it got, got, Alex went absolutely crazy for them. I love Alex so Alex much. Alex is such a good fit with them. Um, and uh, I'm interested, again, this goes to the Andrade thing, if like if they end up do going to Andrade, um, what Alex would do. Um, but yeah, I'm very interested to see where this goes. Should we talk now about your idea that you had for the Arthur Ashe show, what that does to that prediction? Oh, well, my original, I mean, to be fair, I chose the Lucha Brothers on this show, yes. but I, uh, I had said on the podcast that I thought... Um, proud and powerful we're going to take the titles off the Bucks at Arthur Ashe that's not happening now I don't think they're going to get the titles there I feel like it'd be kind of weird for Lucha Brothers to face proud and powerful and drop it there so I could um, see them having a match but maybe I, I, proud and powerful and Eddie Kingston will be on that show whether it's on Rampage Dark or Dynamite whatever they're taping yeah um, I think if anything's going to be there I think it's going to be proud and powerful versus FTR one last time yeah I'd be cool with that I wouldn't have to get sure. their, their grudge match out of the way Maybe. And I wouldn't be surprised if that would be like the main event, and it could be like a street fight. I don't and know. I have kill. I have a feeling that we're gonna get Brian's first match. I think that's gonna be your main event. Yeah. Um. There's a lot of ways you can go. <laughs> yeah, we still got two weeks, so we'll see. Um. And speaking of Arthur Ashe, we officially are going to Arthur Ashe on September 22nd. We got our tickets tonight. I'm probably very glad that we bought our tickets tonight because yeah. I feel like prices might go up. Prices um, might go up and also I feel like they m- might like sell out of like everything. Yeah, so I'm um, pretty happy that we got those. Um, moving on, we go to the Casino Battle Royal. Uh, Abaddon, Big Swole, Anna Jay, Diamante, Emi Sakura, Hikaru Shida, Jade Cargill, Jamie Hayter, Kira Hogan, Kylan King, Layla Hurst, Nyla Rose, Penelope Ford, Rebel, Red Velvet, Riha, Sky Blue, Ty Conti, The Bunny, Thunder Rosa, and The Joker, Ruby Soho. That is the lineup for this. Uh, again, not going to go through and break down the whole match here. It was your pretty standard Rumble Battle Royal. Um, people who I would say were especially over... Um, Anna Jay and Ty Conti continue to be very over with the crowd as baby faces. Sheeta's still loved by everybody. Uh, I'd say Jade gets a pretty good reaction. Um, who else did we have? Um, oh, Sky Blue, Sky Blue, Chicago native. Um, she got a really big reaction, and then uh, the two biggest I would say are Thunder Rosa um, and Ruby Soho. Rosa's been over. Pretty consistently since the Lights Out match she had with Britt. Anytime she comes out, she gets like crazy pops. Some of the biggest of the shows. Um, And then Ruby came out and got this just wonderful ovation from the crowd. Um, And then we got dueling chants for uh, Let's Go Ruby and uh, Let's Go Rosa. um, As they came down to the final two. And eventually, uh, Ruby Soho eliminated Thunder Rosa. So Ruby Soho has a future AEW Women's World Championship shot against Britt Baker. When do you think she takes it? Arthur Ashe. Okay. Um, just a heads up, they so some pictures have come up of the media scrum, uh, and t- it's Tony, oh, Punk, yeah, yeah, and, no, and, we'll and talk, Ruby we'll so far. Ruby, that's the Lucha Brothers are also there. Yeah. yeah okay. So, cool okay. stuff. Um, I think I, this was the best reaction Ruby has gotten in years. This, I think. this is probably the best reaction he's ever gotten. Yeah. I, I mean, I feel like there's one... like Obviously, it's one of the biggest reactions, but I, I'll, I, I'm not a wrestler, so so I don't know. I'm not like a musician or anything who's like had like hometown shows or like played in a really small venue that like everybody's like really into it. I could say this is probably the biggest reaction yeah. she's ever gotten. But it might not be like the best in their mind if they like Maybe, if, I don't like know. if you did some, like your first title win or um well she never won a title in the, in the no title. but like, like she I mean, she's she, been every any every, like in other places. i still feel like going from wwe where you had a faction named after you and then never did anything of note with yeah. them uh and just were i don't i don't think anybody ever remembers a former ruby riot storyline on wwe television i do ruby riot Versus Natalia. Oh, with Jim the Anvil Nightheart after he died. Yeah. Yep. And they did. They put him on the table. They put him on the table. WWE just loves using people's deaths for exploitation. Yep. So, 
Um, I will never understand why like people okay that like I, it, like if I'm like some if I'm Natalia and they ask me if this is okay I would say absolutely the fuck not I don't care if he was a wrestler yeah or like Charlotte Flair and the Paige thing where it's like oh your 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 brother who died of a drug overdose was didn't didn't know how to survive or succeed in life and it's like the fuck is that about <laughs> like who is who is like yeah this is a good thing. I really think this is good storytelling. Um, yes, it gets you heel heat, but it gets you heel heat for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Um, anywho, I thought, again, I thought this was probably the best Casino Battle Royal they've done, besides mm-hmm. maybe the first one at Double or Nothing. But um, uh, really cool to see Ruby in AEW. I think she's going to be a big standout star here. Up next, Chris Jericho versus MJF in the final fight. If Chris Jericho loses, he retires from in-ring competition in AEW forever. MJF's entrance starts, and we have the countdown, the Y2J countdown. The lights go out, and it comes up in the font um, of his WWE Titantron saying Jericho's final match, and the crowd starts booing before he comes out. We have Chris Jericho's entrance. And who, all the, uh, who I'm just assuming is the guitarist of Fozzie, plays him out with an instrumental guitar oh, rendition yeah, of um, Judas. Yeah, uh, his name apparently is Trix, T-R-I-X. Not to be confused with the serial, uh, to which I saw on Twitter somebody, because uh, there's a lot of people who dislike Jericho and Fozzie and stuff. And I did see somebody say, please hide your children, this Trix is not for kids. <laughs> <laughs> which... Yeah. Um, also, I think it was Excalibur or Tony who was like, "Oh, you've got to wonder what type of shape these guys are in since they just played a show in Joliet, uh, Illinois last night." <laughs> and I mean, yeah, this guy looks so much younger than Jericho. <laughs> like, I really hope the rest of his band is like guys in their twenties and thirties, and then it's fifty-something-year-old Jericho trying to live out his rock star dreams. In his 50s. Um, yeah. Anyway, this was an absolutely disgusting entrance. Um, the guitar just didn't sound good. Uh, and the crowd was off timing with it. It was just... It, it was just... No. Um, I don't really have... I don't, I don't really have words on this one. Um, it just wasn't wasn't what it should have been um if anything you should have just had jericho and fozzy perform judas and that would have been probably better but anyway this match i although i feel like jericho might have gotten winded by maybe that's it. actually a good point <laughs> because like if the like if excalibur had to point out like I, you know what i do say because rob pointed out that the like it could have used like the other instruments i feel like if they had like even if it's just like fozzy playing the instrumental it would have been better than just the guitar yeah 100 um, percent. yeah so anyway this i feel one, like that's been a lot of the complaints about shinsuke's entrance too with rick boogs has been it's just rick boogs's guitar over the theme and obviously that's an instrumental but like if you mess up anything yeah it, just it sounds so bad um, this went 21 minutes and 15 seconds. I will give props to Jericho and MJF. I did not think this was 21 minutes. I thought this no. was like 15. This felt real this, short this... compared to everything else. Anyone who says Chris Jericho still can't go or that he's not putting in good performances, I disagree with wholeheartedly. I would not say MJF carried this match. Jericho has put in some fantastic performances the past like two months um, with the, the whole Labors of Jericho thing. And I thought he was on fire these last two MJF matches. The the final labor in here, I thought Jericho did really well. Um, obviously, it's not prime Jericho from like his best years in WWE, but I feel like he's really shown that he can still go. Um, and so I was not disappointed by this. I thought this was another really solid match between him and MJF um, in their trilogy of singles matches. I thought this was... I don't know if I... <sighs> This might be my favorite one just because of how well done the ending of this was. Um, you had Wardlow come down to try and get involved. And then uh, Jake Hager came down to play uh, basically Peacekeeper. And we had two refs come down. And while this happened, we had MJF nail Chris Jericho with the bat and then a Judas effect. 
and he pinned Jericho next to the ropes. Jericho got his foot on the ropes. Aubrey didn't see it, but then we had the explanation that Paul Turner saw it because he was out there at ringside trying to contain this fight between Wardlow and Hager, and it made sense as to why this match was restarted because a ref was there and saw it with his own eyes and told Aubrey, hey, you missed this. And then we got the restart here, and we had another great fake finish where we got MJF immediately putting Jericho into uh, Salt of the Earth. And Jericho, regardless of your opinion on him, the performance here, he, I, he that entire audience came unglued thinking he was going to tap here. Uh, he rolled MJF up. Uh, MJF kicked, up, uh, kicked out at two, got him back into Salt of the Earth. Jericho rolled through it and got him into Walls of Jericho. And MJF taps out to the Walls of Jericho. Jericho wins. MJF still looks like absolute money coming out of this feud. I don't think MJF's hurt by this one minute or, or whatever you want to say. Uh, one minute doesn't really make sense. Um, but I thought Jericho looked great here. I thought MJF looked great. And I was a big fan of this match. Um, and again, finish-wise, I thought this was done expertly by both men. Uh, and Aubrey and Paul Turner as well. So uh, a big two thumbs up from me on this one. I've been very critical of Chris Jericho. Uh, in AEW Um, I understood why he was the first champ but I didn't think he excelled as the first champ Um, especially towards the end of the run Um, I think that he hasn't had the greatest performances of his career for obvious reasons one is age two is just not having the stamina to go and do certain moves anymore. Um, him versus MJF, all three of their solo matches have been phenomenal. I don't know what it is. If it's just he clicks really well with MJF because they're so similar in personalities and characters and stuff. But they just work magically together. Um, I am on the opposite side where I thought the, um, the labors of Jericho were good, not great, all of them. I think Gage was really good. MJF was really good. I thought Spears was really good. Spears, I watched the ending of. I, I didn't see Hooventude or Wardlow. Hooventude, I thought, was absolutely atrocious. Because Hoovy was is still very fast and very mobile, and Jericho is not as much, and they misclicked on a lot of big moves, and that took me out of it. And Wardlow, I don't remember if I even watched it or not, so I can't talk about that one. But the multi man stuff that they've done has been okay. Um, like, him in, like, the Blood and Guts match. Wouldn't say he stole the show or anything or did anything great in that match. Um, in the Stadium Stampede, it's a mainly cinematic match, so can't really say anything about that. Uh, he wasn't involved in the ending of it, so he didn't do wrestle in front of the crowd part. Um, but he's still very good on the mic um, when he's not on commentary. Um, and he's still a good performer to some extent uh he just needs to click he needs to find certain people because there's a lot of people in AEW that he doesn't click well with and it's a lot of the younger guys i feel like who are very much more fast-paced have a lot of stamina and shouldn't be expected to carry a match at that point with an with a veteran Um, I mean, I would say Jericho, the match we saw with him and Darby in Philly, I thought that was good. His match with, his match with Jungle. Darby doesn't really have bad matches. No, but like the match with Jungle Boy, like where he had the last 10 minutes, that was good. Yeah, I forgot Um, about that. The stuff he's done with MJF, really good. Um, Oh, also the thing he did with Scorpio Sky on Thanksgiving of 2019. I thought that was pretty good. I don't even remember that. Um, Aside from that, I, I don't really know any matches where he was like paired up against like younger guys where yeah. I thought anything of it's it. It's not like Scorpio's like a young guy either. He just looks no. very young. I yeah, think he, he's like in his mid to late 30s. He is. Yeah. Um, anywho, uh, from there, 
Um, just checking real quick to make sure I didn't miss anything uh, in between matches. Um, no, from there we went directly into CM Punk versus Darby Allen. Darby came out with Sting. Sting went, yeah, Sting then went to the back. CM Punk came out, got the monster reaction everybody would expect from this. First few minutes of the match was just basically them staring at each other as the crowd went crazy. Um, and then the whole beginning of this match was mainly just grappling um, and occasional things with Darby killing himself, like being thrown into the turnbuckle and then flying to the outside of the ring. Absolutely mad. Like, just an absolute madman Darby is. Um, from taking the drill claw in the body bag, getting thrown over the top rope in the body bag, getting thrown down the steps at... Um, uh, Daly's place, zip lining, uh, whatever it may be, Darby, Darby has no limits here. <laughs> um, I gotta say, I, again, we were talking about this, and as the match was getting started, Sam said that you know everybody has to realize Punk could not be good anymore. Um, I did not come out with that same outlook. I thought Punk, for how old is he? Like 40, 42, 43? CM Punk age, forty-two years old. For a forty-two-year-old man who has not wrestled in seven years. Thought CM Punk looked pretty great, uh, pretty damn great. Yep. Um, he doesn't really look like he lost a step. Um, I thought him and Darby had a really fun match here by the end of it. Um, we had some good near falls where they actually had me biting that Darby was going to win. Um, especially when he did that, I don't even know what it's called, whatever that special pin that he does um, that he beat. Uh, what's it Oh, the Last on? Supper. Last Supper. There you go. I love that. Um, I, I thought he there was a chance he was actually going to win there. Um we had Punk nail a go to sleep to Darby, but Darby fell through the ropes and landed on the floor. Um, that looked fun, uh, like a fun bump to take. Darby loves taking bumps that sh- normal people shouldn't. Um, eventually, uh, Darby went for the coffin drop, and Punk just sat up to dodge it. Um, and eventually, he hit another go to sleep, and CM Punk wins. He wins his first match back in seven years. Darby Kind of comes out of this still feeling like a made man, especially because Punk is his first match back. Um, or sorry, Darby is Punk's first match back. And it just felt like a big deal. Um, afterwards, Sting came back down. Uh, him and Punk have a handshake. And him and uh, Sting check on Darby and they get him up. And Punk and Darby shake each other's hands. And it was a nice show of respect. So uh, this is as good as I feel like I was expecting. Um, I feel like this delivered, probably even over-delivered for... I, felt like i was expecting this to be kind of shorter than it was um so no complaints for me cm punk he's back pretty cool stuff uh full gear is officially saturday november 13th so it's been moved and then we got paul white versus qt marshall and at this point not even at this point when we found out cm punk and darby was not the semi-main event i had said oh shit they're gonna do something big in qt marshall and paul white maybe danielson's gonna come out there and save paul white that did not happen. Instead, we had a three-minute match where Paul White dismantled the factory and beat them all senseless and eventually uh, just choke slammed QT Marshall and won. That was that. Uh, the crowd cheered for Paul, and that's all that mattered. They could not have given a shit about QT in the factory. <laughs> um, we officially got the announcement of Moxley versus Suzuki for Dynamite. Moxley cut a promo talking about how him and Suzuki are tied together. Uh, he says that them in the ring together is the best drug in the world, and he should know he has tried them all. Um, and he says Cincinnati, they bury bullies, and that's what he's going to do to Suzuki. Uh, we got the, well, they would already announced this, but we know that we're getting Dustin versus Malachi Black, and we got a nice promo from Malachi Black. Was very happy that he made his presence felt on this pay-per-view. Got one of his Black Room promos and talking about um, how Cody, he took out Cody, and he still has yet to come back. And Ruby will officially address the AEW fans on Wednesday's Dynamite. So that is what is announced for the Cincinnati show. Um, I guess since I didn't give thoughts on Punk, I thought oh, that... Oh, I completely forgot. That's yeah, I that was... Oopsie, yeah, um, I thought that was a really good match. Uh, I've said it before on this podcast, also me and Angela have talked about it on the Impact po- Podcast, shameful, shameless plug, shameful plug, I don't know. Um, but... Uh, we pointed out that like Angelo, uh, Rob, Sam, Joey, have all been big wrestling fans for quite some time, and like they watched Punk throughout his WWE run. Um, whereas myself, I didn't watch Punk's like career. The only match I saw 
like as it happened was the Royal Rumble match that he had that year uh, in 2014, which was his last show with the company. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, I I haven't experienced like the whole like, oh my gosh, this is the greatest wrestler of all time, or like at the time. He can do anything. I didn't. I didn't see the Nexus as it happened. I didn't see the Money in the Bank with Cena. I didn't see the Straight Edge Society. I didn't see him versus Taker or him versus Brock or any of those other feuds that people always talk about. Um, so, for me, this is like I, I've gone back and watched certain matches and been like, yeah, he's really good, but like I. I never had the connection that I do like that I do with other people where other people have very strong connections to him when it comes to wrestling. Um, but like seeing the outpouring of emotions whenever he comes out and like whenever he wrestles at this point is just very um, it's very interesting because there's not somebody that I can think of other than Brian. Um, who has that way with people where like people are like just outpouring of emotion, different emotions when he wrestles. Um, and I think part of it is because he was away for so long, but the other part is just how good he, he was. Um, and this showed that he can still go. Obviously it wasn't like, this isn't going to go down as like one of the greatest matches ever or one of Darby's best matches in AEW or one of Punk's best matches of his career. Um, but this was really good. Um, I'm excited to see... I'm interested to see what goes next for Punk because I feel like there's so many different things you could do. Does he want to continue to go and like just match up with different people uh, who are younger to try to see like different styles of him? Does he go for a title? Does he go with a f- feud with somebody who's a heel? And it'll be interesting to see where else he goes from here. Because I don't know who he would go... Like, if he was going to have a feud with, I don't know who it would be. Now, I don't know who I'd want it to be. I don't know. There's plenty of options, and I'm sure... Because I don't think Punk's going to lose for quite some time. No. And I don't think he should. No. Um, uh, it, so it's definitely interesting, I think... Like how often he's gonna wrestle? I think we're probably at some point, as strange as it sounds, I think we're gonna get Punk versus Daniel Garcia. Yeah, um, because they did seem to tease it on Rampage this week. Um, yeah, which is insane. If I'm Daniel Garcia, I have to be on cloud fucking nine that CM Punk just came back and might be wrestling me. Yeah, um, I think that would be a good match. Um. I don't know. I I just don't know what I want from Punk. I'm I'm open to whatever he wants to do. Yeah, I think it. What would be interesting? We haven't talked about it. Him versus Miro. Um, I would also like to see Punk versus Malachi Black at some point. Um, I think that would be fun. Yeah. Um, but I think that's ways away at this point. Yeah, no. Because Cody it's, and Black are still locked. Yeah, and that's at least for another month or two. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, like, if it's not Mox to take it off of Miro, that would be one hell of a thing. I still think Sammy. I don't think Pop Yeah. Off no, I don't either, but that's another option, I think, that's available. Yeah. Again, it just depends on, is Punk going to be wrestling regularly or is he going to be appearing regularly he'll he'll appear regularly i don't think he'll be wrestling on dynamite regularly Mm. um i do think the feud to do eventually uh whenever hangman page comes back and wins the title page versus uh punk oh that'd be a big one and you can do a lot there um anyway main event oh jesus christ just slapped the mic sorry for that everybody if i startled you christian cage versus kenny omega uh for the AEW world championship Um, these two come out to kind of muted reactions compared to some of the other people on the card tonight. Um, and as Ryan said, I think by this point, people were starting to get tired. Um, they did pull out a really solid main event, I thought, and the crowd eventually did get into this towards the end. Um, but it was a bit of a struggle at the beginning. Um, but again, Omega's 
pretty capable of getting crowds back into things. So uh, I don't think it really hampered them too much. Uh, by no means was this the match of the show, but uh, I thought him and Christian had a really solid main event match here. Christian still has continued to put on some excellent performances since coming back to being a full-time wrestler. Kenny always puts on the best show possible. And yeah, um, lots of teasing of the kill switch throughout the match. Um, as well as lots of teasing of the one-winged angel. We had a bunch of table spots, um, some brutal looking ones where Kenny stomped uh, Christian through it towards the beginning. And that did not look fun to take. Um, eventually, this went down uh, with the finish where Kenny... Oh, I, do, I don't want to even gloss over this. At one point, Don Callis got in the ring and... <laughs> Uh, yes. was behind Christian and he was doing like jazz fingers and it looked like he was getting ready to tickle Christian Cage. I'm not going to lie. I would have loved to live in a world where he actually tickled Christian Cage and then like ate the kill switch. Um, I think that would have been pretty funny. Um, eventually a kill switch was hit and Kenny got to kick out and the finish came with Kenny and Christian both on the top rope trying to go for their finishers and Kenny was the one who got the one-winged angel off the top rope and officially retained the title with an avalanche one-winged angel. Uh, again, I thought really solid main event, so I'm not going to complain. Um, living in an alternate timeline where Hangman Page was on this show and they did the match here, it wouldn't work because of what they had planned here and what they did. They made. I, I feel like some people are going to have to like bite their words on like how they were disappointed that Hangman Page didn't get to have the shot here. It, it wasn't time. They, they, AEW, what they did in this main event uh, and the post match, like, I'm sorry, as much as I want Paige to win the title, they made the right call. And I don't think pinning Kenny with Christian before he had to lose the Impact title hurts as much as some people might have thought. Um, I still think when Paige comes back, it's going to be a big deal. Um, and so, yeah, again, I, I think they made the right call by taking Paige off the pay per view. Yeah, this. Hey man, I've been a Christian fan for no apparent reason. Um, again, never really saw much of his work when he was doing stuff because again, came into watching wrestling regularly. Twenty fourteen Rumble, um, but uh, him and I think a lot of people were questioning how could he go still, like if he could go. Why the fuck were they hyping him up so much to be like this Hall of Fame roster talent who's going to be the biggest signing AEW's ever had at this point? And thinking like, okay, so that would mean he's bigger than Jericho, bigger than Sting, um, bigger than Big Show, Paul White, um, all these people. And it's like, Christian's not that. But he has outperformed, I think, what a lot of people thought he could do again with him not being medically cleared since 2014. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, he had that one, what was it, a one random non-sanctioned match with Randy it Orton like that match. didn't really happen. Yeah. Um, and him being in the Rumble. Those are like the two things he's, he's done since then. Um, and you would not think that this man, like, is fighting, or was like could not be cleared for wrestling and didn't have it in him anymore and was just like a lower mid-card guy near the end of his career with a uh, WWE. Um, this is... It shows that he still has the love of wrestling, but also that he still has a shit ton of talent because he's performed well with everybody he's worked with. Um, and he's definitely... I would say he's definitely one of the best signings that... AEW has gotten uh, other than like obviously like the original roster like of the people who have come since I'd say he's probably up there with one of the best that they've had and that's insane to think of um, him and Kenny have really good chemistry there's good built up story I'm perfectly fine with him being like him of taking the title off of Kenny he is somebody to look forward to on Impact Weekly. Um, and he clearly cares about, at least character-wise, he cares about Impact, which is great. 
um, and him being like, I want to work with everybody in Impact and just like give back to Impact for like them being the first place to actually see me as a singles person and like a, being able to be a star. And he doesn't need to be like he can be on AEW and succeed there, but like I feel like. He, it's weird to say, but I feel like he has more to offer impact than he does at AEW currently storyline wise. Um, and I think that's where what happened after the show, after the match, can take place and kind of move Christian from being the guy who's trying to run, do things for both companies to taking a step back from being like the t- a top guy currently in AEW. And being like, let's focus on the Impact title. Because we have, like, as somebody who watches Impact, we haven't had that in nine months. So, um, do you want to take it from there about what happened next? Yeah. Absolutely. After the match, the Young Bucks come on down. As this was happening, I was basically calling every move that was going to happen here. Um, And I said, I said... I said as this was happening, the Young Bucks are going to come down. They're going to beat Christian down with the Elite. Jurassic Express is going to come out and make the save. And then I said, oh, like Brian's going to come out and make the save. But what if Cole's involved here somehow? And they beat down. (laughs) They beat down Christian. Jurassic Express come on down. Uh, They get taken out. Omega gets on the mic. And he asks the crowd if they're finally uh, starting to understand He doesn't care if you have hometown heroes. No one is on his level, and it doesn't matter where he goes. One thing is for sure. When it comes to this AEW title, the only people that would ever have a chance to beat him are either not here, already tired, or already dead. Retired. Retired, sorry. (laughs) Already retired. (laughs) I am tired. It is 1.30 in the morning. <clears throat> or already dead, and as soon as he says dead, the lights go out, the crowd starts shaking. We cut to the stage. Adam Cole has arrived in AEW. Electric moment. Uh, we all screamed in our living room. Adam Cole comes out to a monster reaction, very similar to his debut um, at TakeOver Brooklyn, probably more so just because his name has gotten significantly bigger thanks to NXT, where he has now jumped ship from. Uh, Pretty wild stuff here. Adam Cole makes his way down to the ring. They have a stare down with him and Omega, and he super kicks Jungle Boy and then embraces the Elite. We get the money shot of the Bucks kissing his cheeks and Omega kissing the top of his head. Kenny, during his match with... (laughs) with Christian Uh, when he put him through the table he did the Steve Urkel did I do that and he gets on the mic and says to quote Steve Urkel he uh, did I do that and Adam Cole is one of their best friends so what else would happen he gives Cole the mic and says it's story time with Adam Cole baby it's official the elite is the most dominant faction in the history of the wrestling business and there is ain't no chance that anyone's going to stop them. Omega says that's what he calls a happy ending, and all that's left is to send the uh, cr- uh, crowd home happy. And so, without further ado, he must bid us all goodbye. And before he can say goodnight, <laughs> the ride of the Valkyries hits instead of a final countdown. Brian Danielson makes his debut in All Elite Wrestling to another crazy reaction. He co- he comes out. Comes down to the ring and he makes the save as him, Jurassic Express, and Christian all run off the Elite. Um, And what an insane ending to an already insane pay-per-view. On this show, we had Ruby Soho, Satoshi Kojima, Minoru Suzuki, uh, Adam Cole, (laughs) and... um, and Brian Danielson all make their AEW debuts. What a ins- and technically Paul White in- and technically Paul White made his in ring debut. What an ins and CM Punk returned to wrestling. Yeah, this was an insane pay per view. There again, I would say like Paul and QT Marshall was was three minutes and ten seconds, which compared to everything on this match, or not on this match on this card, was minuscule in comparison. I would say this was one of the best pay-per-views I've ever seen from top to bottom. Um, 
none of the actual like matches were bad. Like even Paul White and QT, it wasn't like uh, like it wasn't atrocious. It was just a squash match of Paul Murder and QT. Um, obviously, it could have just been on Dynamite, but it was here. Um, they wanted to give Paul a big debut, and that's fine. I really like they just showing respect of his career. Um, from top to bottom, this is AEW's best show they have ever done. Um, this will go down as an all-time wrestling event in just... AEW did not come out and promise that any of these names would be on this show. They didn't even tease Ruby. They didn't tease Suzuki. Uh, very, like, light teases of Brian and Cole. And all on one pay-per-view, we got the debuts, and still none of them felt overshadowed by each other. I feel like all of them came out feeling, like, equally important. Um, obviously not as much Suzuki because he's not signing with AEW. He's just a New Japan wrestler. But Ruby, uh, Ruby, uh, Danielson, and Cole all felt like huge like things here. So absolutely insane. Like, it just, words cannot describe this show, I feel. Um, I am expecting this to, to be one of the biggest pay-per-views uh, for AEW. Probably their biggest show. Um one would assume this is going to blow away their like previous numbers for pay-per-view buys. Um, I, I'm not going to give like an actual like number rating, but this is thumbs up all around to every single thing on this card, basically. Yeah. Um, I, I would, in a heartbeat, I would rewatch this show. Uh, this is so good on every level. Yeah, this was a fantastic show. This makes me feel like... Oh my gosh, it just makes me feel so happy to be a wrestling fan currently. Um, I don't know if AEW can top this. <laughs> and that's something crazy to think about. Um, this was just fantastic. I think they're obviously QT and Paul didn't feel like a pay per view match, but cool to see Paul. You can just see how happy he is to be wrestling and being like liked by people and like having he, he looks so happy to be there and you can say the same for every single person it feels like who's come back to or come to to aew from wwe who you could be like they were mismanaged ruby looked like a, she was almost looked like she was like about to like cry happy tears as she walked down for for her entrance uh, CM Punk is smiling all the time, basically, um, and like it, it's just one of those things where it's like you can say like fans can be like, oh, like WWE did did this and did that, and they didn't use these guys properly, and if why would you even be there? And of the people who've left, who have come to AEW, you can see why they left. They want to feel happy doing something that they love. And this is clearly the place. Um, I, I was just looking at like uh, Twitter and like the media scrum, and quote from Daniel or Brian Danielson uh, is AEW. Let's fucking go. Uh, no, that was not from the media oh? scrum. That was from after the show went off the air. Got a oh, okay, even better. Like that's yeah. just wild. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, what's your rating of the show? Two thumbs up. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't do like number ratings. Yeah, fair. Uh, yeah. Favorite match and favorite, ma favorite match and then least favorite match, not counting QT and Paul White. Least favorite match easily the women's title match. Uh, I just wasn't invested in it because I didn't see Statlander winning at all, and I don't know. It just uh, didn't seem like a great storyline uh, for your big show. Best match overall. Would be the steel cage match, and honestly, there that's definitely, in my opinion, the best tag match this year. May it's probably up there for one of the matches of the year. Yeah, a hundred percent. I would say the the steel cage match will go down as uh, like match of the year candidate, which is insane because I feel like anytime WWE does steel cage matches, everybody is not excited for them. And AEW, their two steel cage matches they've done have both been really fun. Um, for me, I would say, but yeah, I would say favorite match was definitely Steel Cage match. Um, least favorite? Man, that's hard. Honestly, I'd, 
probably go the same thing. I'd probably say Britain, Chris. And by again, by no means do I think it was bad. I said it was still pretty good. So um, we'll go through some of the stuff from the media scrum just because uh, people have been tweeting out about it. Um, so after the show, we had the promo from Brian Danielson. Um, he says that uh, ba, ba, ba. he said he loved where he worked before, which was WWE. Um, notes that the the talent is part of the reason he came to AEW uh, because of the work they've done and basically uh, he, he says that thanking them any of the early signings uh, basically making people from WWE take notice and wanting to jump ship. Um, he says that when we the fans see these new talents in AEW, um, he wants to thank the original members of AEW's roster. Um, and as Ryan said, he did say, AEW, let's fucking go. Uh, That's just close so the show. Weird to see. Uh, I also want to say that uh, during after Punk's match, uh, he screamed, and Darby and Sting had left the ring, he just screamed out, let's fucking go. And then got on the uh, the yeah that's oh hey man never forget uh, Moxley's promo after Revolution yeah where he said wow what the fuck is that yeah so um, in regards to the debuts of Adam Cole and Brian Danielson CM Punk said I got a boner for that <laughs> um, okay uh, CM Punk says that AEW's competition is the uh, fans and keeping them interested he says they uh, they focus on what they're doing and that's the way to grow. CM Punk says that he's here to help, but also to learn. Um, he says that Tony Khan was the only person that could get him to sign. Uh, Punk says, or apparently Meltzer asked a question, but Punk says that it was the way that AEW talent handled Brody Lee's passing that convinced him to end up in AEW and thought it was special. Um, he says the, the handshake with Sting wasn't planned. Uh, we got him and Tony hugging it out. Um, Penta talks about how him and Phoenix used to sell masks outside in Mexico and sleep on the metro and how they're never going to forget where they came from um, and both were tearing up um, talking about how uh, just putting over how emotional they are about winning the championships finally um, they said that they do not wear their masks because they're ugly <laughs> um, they they just put over the meaning of what the mask is. Um, they also said that they do want to do a hair versus mask match against the Young Bucks if Tony approves it. Interesting. So there you go. Um, just other stuff that I'm seeing. Um, Dave LaGreca of Busted Open has some quotes. Um, Tony Khan said that tonight was, quote, the best feeling in the world uh, when describing uh, what All Out meant uh, to him and wrestling. Um, we also have Brian, um, uh, Adam Cole saying that making the decision to join AEW was actually a fairly easy one to do uh, and Brian Danielson saying that uh, he joined AEW because he wanted to be able to push his limits and, uh, which is weird seeing that his Twitter name is still at WWE Brian, Daniel Bryan that'll change <laughs> yeah it's one of those things like who, who uh, I think Paul White when he debuted it was still like at Big Show or yeah. something, and Rhino for like a year and a half after joining Impact was still WWE Rhino. <laughs> um, Ruby was apparently very close to breaking down during her interview. Um, says it felt like home immediately. Um, she says that she hopes the women on the AEW roster help bring out a new side of her. She wants to go out there and have good matches while also elevating the rest of the division. Uh, she said that she was sad leaving WWE because she made a lot of lifelong friends, but she was okay, uh, okay closing that chapter. She knew instantly that she wanted to go to AEW, and she was simply hoping there was a place for her within the company. Uh, Tony confir uh, confirms today was the first day that he even met Ruby. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, Adam Cole was also there for an interview. Uh, he said that he had an excellent four-year experience with WWE, but he knew that for a while he wanted to come to AEW and said it was a fairly easy decision. You'll love to see that. Um, Adam Cole says that the talk he had with Vince in talking about re-signing with WWE went great, and they talked about several things, and he did not have a bad experience with him. 
Uh, he says that he can. F uh, he feels like he can talk to Tony Khan about anything, and that his love for pro wrestling is contagious. Uh, TK says that all of it happened very, very quickly, and then Cole says that the only person he was able to talk to uh, since tonight was his mom. He says he was so excited about his debut that his legs were shaking, and he says it's a highlight of his entire life. Uh, Tony Khan says that Adam Cole was the one person in NXT that struck fear in him during the Wednesday Night Wars. And then we got Brian uh, talking, and he knows that it was an internal battle about uh, if he wanted to leave WWE, says because he did love working in WWE, but he wanted to be uh, he wanted one part of his life to be wild, hence why he is now in AEW. Uh, he says that it would be difficult to have Brie Bella in AEW. She's happy in WWE and has a lot of business connections there. Um, he says he did have some creative in WWE, but he just prefers sticking to the wrestling. He says the way AEW honored Brody Lee also influenced his decision. So it seems like that's a recurring case that we're seeing. Yeah. Danielson knows that he does love Vince McMahon and they have a great relationship, but that Vince can sometimes be overprotective of him. He says WWE made him a generous offer and they were going to let him do things outside of WWE. Uh, Danielson says he wants to work in New Japan and he wants to go to Mexico. Uh, his goal is to produce professional or sorry, excellent professional wrestling and he does end it with AEW is legitimate competition. Wow. So um, Other things not involved in the media scrum, but just people on Twitter in different companies. Uh, Going to start with CM Punk uh, <laughs> finding his tweet from right before he left a, uh, WWE saying, this poop just ain't fun anymore, To uh, and quote tweeting it saying, this shit is fun again, um, which, yes. Um Renee Paquette saying wrestling is so cool. Uh, uh, Brian Alvarez claiming that this is one of the best wrestling events of all time. Um, Dave LaGreca saying that this is one of the biggest moments in wrestling history. Um, Dustin Rhodes says, Tonight I saw more passion in one ring than ever before. Tonight I saw a passionate AEW fan base. Those two things make it for an incredibly energetic show. This was incredible. Hashtag all out uh, at AEW. Um, got a lot of former wrestlers, or current WWE wrestlers, a lot of the women, uh, talking about how much this means for them, seeing how happy Ruby is, mm -hmm. which that's great. Um, Kevin Owens, don't know what this is in regards to, but he said... Uh, it's awesome when good things happen to good people, but it's even better when good things happen to great people. Um, yeah, you've got Sean Spears saying that uh, Spears versus Cole, Spears versus Punk, and Spears versus Danielson all have to happen, um, which probably will just because it feels like he goes against everybody. Um, and, of course, I guess we should also point out the greatest tweet of the night. Uh Kenta, a.k.a. Lil' K, in all caps, fuck you, CM Punk. That is a, uh... uh and I guess I should... My, my two favorite uh, tweets of the night. Uh, Miro, uh, ask and you shall receive. Your nuts have been redeemed. Uh, followed by a quote tweet from his wife saying, I'll redeem your nuts when you get home. Good, good. Uh... Oh, and Jericho tweeted out, the game has changed. Yeah, so there you go. Big night in professional wrestling history. Uh, Joey did not join us, but he did want me to make a note. Uh, I asked what his thoughts were on the show, and all he said is, I love wrestling. So that is Joey's official thoughts. I'm sure we'll talk about it when we review Dynamite this week. But that is that. Thank you for joining us for the All Out Review as part of the Deep Six Wrestling Podcast. We will be back later this week, obviously, as with the aforementioned shows. So if you're new here, be sure to subscribe. It helps us out. You get free content. Follow us over on Twitter at Deep Six Wrestling. And until then, we will talk to you guys next time. Bye.